I'm here in the Yorkshire Dales to meet some of the people involved in the current conservation efforts. We'll see efforts to understand bat populations, the beauty of the peregrine falcons at Malham Cove, and what's being done to protect the white-clawed crayfish. But first I'm following a walk from Hawes to Snaysham. The route follows part of the Pennine Way, the National Trail, uh, that runs from Derbyshire up to Northumberland. Um, it also uses part of the existing open access land to, uh, to link the Pennine Way down uh, into Snaysome itself and then follow some historic footpaths across Snaysome, crossing Snaysome Beck and up into the forestry plantation uh, to, the, to the viewpoint. This viewpoint was set up by the landowner, Hugh Kemp, with the help from the Yorkshire Dales National Park Authority and the Forestry Commission for a group of delightful little creatures. <laughs> The Red Squirrel Feeding Station is nestled in coniferous woodland just off the public footpath, giving visitors a close encounter with its inhabitants. I've come to meet Ian Court of the Yorkshire Dales National Park Authority to find out about their conservation and gain some insight into monitoring local populations. One of the key things the National Park Authority has been doing in recent years is to work out the distribution of, of red squirrels. At sites like this they're very obvious where they're coming down to feeders, but in areas of woodland where there's no public access, it's, it's been difficult to know what the actual distribution has been. So we've been working closely using a lot of our Dales volunteers to actually survey and monitor areas so we can work out the true distribution of the red squirrels. And with the invasion of the grey squirrel, a haven like this one here at Snaysham is more than welcome. The red squirrels here are very active and numerous, but how well are the local populations doing? The local population is doing relatively well at the moment for red squirrels. They've moved into this area of North Yorkshire from adjacent areas of Cumbria in the last 15 years. The conifer woodlands like this one here have come to cone bearing age, so there's plenty of food for them. So the population is quite widespread in this particular area. This is largely thanks to Hugh, who arrived here in 1967 with his wife Jane, growing Christmas trees. In the early 1990s, they dedicated their time transforming the woodland into a habitat for bird life. But when the squirrels arrived in 1997, Hugh has been building them a happy home ever since. The red squirrels adore um, the, the cones of Scots pine, larch and sickle spruce, noble fir, and we still got uh, stands of, of noble fir, which originally we were growing as uh, Christmas trees. We've left those specifically really, initially that, that they were set aside for the bird life, but now um, we, we know that uh, the red squirrels adore uh, the tones of noble fur. And with his experience as a forester, Hugh has cultivated a mosaic of tree species, creating habitats for a huge array of wildlife. He uses a variety of woodland management techniques to create this hospitable environment, and he explained to me why he ring barks sycamores to remove unwanted trees and thin, overly dense woodland. Ring barking uh, these sycamore, it takes the, uh, the sycamore on average about three to four years to die, uh, and it will stay standing upright, but uh, it will no longer be of any interest to the grey squirrels. Meanwhile, it will be uh, dying off and producing insects, which will be great for the bird life and the red squirrels, because red squirrels adore um, a certain amount of insects in, in their diet. He must be doing something right, because love was in the air at the feeding station.
So one of the misconceptions about red squirrels is that they actually do hibernate over over winter, but that's not actually true. They are active throughout the year. Uh, they they don't like cold, wet weather in the winter, so they might become less active over a period of a few days at really bad weather. But they will have to feed after a few days, so they will be out and about and visiting feeders like this throughout the year. The red squirrel is the only native native species of squirrel you get in this country. So it, you know it's been here for for thousands, millions of years. So it's a part of our heritage, one of our native species. It's really important to protect. And I quite agree. So I asked Ian how we the public could get involved in protecting our red squirrels. The general public can play a real key part in this really in helping us work out where the squirrels are. So a lot of the work we've done looking at the distribution, some of that work has come from members of the public who have sent in sightings to the National Park Authority. So if you're out and about in the Yorkshire Dales National Park in an area like this, go to the National Park website, fill in a form and send in your sightings and you can play a, a real part in actually help us work out the distribution of this particular species. The outlook for red squirrels hasn't been bright since the early 1900s, as the grey squirrels spread throughout the UK. But here in the Yorkshire Dales, we're breaking that trend. Nationally, the red squirrel population has been declining in both numbers in range in recent years because of the problems caused by the introduced grey squirrels. Here in the Yorkshire Dales National Park, it's been a real success story, as we've actually shown that the range of the red squirrel has actually increased. So they've moved from adjacent areas of Cumbria into areas of North Yorkshire like this, into the conifer plantations we're studying now. And the beauty of the feeding station is that it's open to the public to interact and enjoy these wonderful animals all year round. The Yorkshire Dales National Park Authority has provided all the resources you need to follow the walk, from Hawes to Snazen. You can find out information about the trail from uh, our website and there's a uh, trail map and also an MP3 download on the website and, uh, and instructions for how to get along the route as well. Talking to the area ranger Matt Neal, it's evident that the National Park Authority puts conservation at the heart of its work here in the Yorkshire Dales. Actually getting people involved in conservation uh, and giving people an opportunity to see something um, is very important, not just for red squirrels and not just for this area, but also trying to engage people in conservation in general, um, whether it's in this area, in this national park or, or across the world. Next, I'm off to meet Paul Bradley of PBA Applied Ecology, who in 2000 discovered what is threatening our native white-clawed crayfish. White-clawed crayfish, um, they were very widespread in the Yorkshire Dales until uh, 10, 20 years ago. It'd be commonplace, really, for kids to go down to the stream and pick a few out, pick a bucket full out, um, and we'll play with them like kids do. Unfortunately, uh, that's changed dramatically, more dramatically than almost any other species I can think of. And the population has crashed throughout much of the Yorkshire Dales, uh, as it has elsewhere in the country, and with native crayfish throughout Europe, in fact. Their population decline has been due to an invasive species, just like the red squirrels. The main uh, cause of the decline of white fog crayfish has been the introduction of American signal crayfish to this country. There you go. There's an American single crayfish, blood red underneath the claws, very distinctive, very aggressive. The rest of them, there we go, there's a range of sizes there, all from this, this very small area in this, uh, in this stream. They outcompete them, they're extremely dominant in the river system, um, and they also carry uh, a fungal-like disease called crayfish plague. Uh, now, once crayfish plague enters the river system, it spreads throughout the river system, and very unusually in, in the natural system, it kills every single white clawed crayfish that is infected. It infects them all in the end, and it absolutely wipes out the population, leaving no survivors at all. It's, uh, it's ranked by the IUCN as one of the 100 worst invasive organisms in the world. White-clawed crayfish tend to be associated with species-rich freshwater communities, but in contrast... Where we find American signal crayfish, um, increasingly we find a very denuded fish population. So it's a, it's a real disaster that American signal crayfish have been introduced, not just for 
our native white claw crayfish, but also to traditional uh, salmonid fisheries, classic game fisheries in the north of England and, uh, and elsewhere. This invasion hasn't gone unnoticed or unpublicised, but misguided attempts to remove signal crayfish have only aggravated the problem. In trapping signal crayfish, it's been conclusively shown that it just that just takes out the large ones and enables more of the younger ones to survive and spread. Surprisingly, the main predator of juvenile crayfish are the adults, and so populations have increased even further. But there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Part of the response of the Environment Agency has been to attempt to hold them for long periods and also to breed them with increasing success at one particular site uh, in the Orchard Dales. More successful breeding uh, program for white claw crayfish anywhere. And that is where I went, to meet Neil Handy of the Environment Agency, who set up the breeding facility. Here we are at uh, White Claw Crayfish Breeding Facility uh, at the top of the Yorkshire Dales in Ribblesdale. It consists of seven tanks, which are in two inline systems of three tanks, which fall through each other from a header tank, which is above. The idea of leaving them into two separate areas, if you like, uh, was so that if we did get a problem in one side, then the other side should be fine. So it allowed us biosecurity on site from in two different lines. And Neil has kindly agreed to show me some juvenile white clawed crayfish, whilst going through the breeding facility setup. So if you're looking here, I think there's a three. They're actually uh, flu protection cages for these. And what I've got these set up for is for the juveniles to go into. The juveniles are hiding from the adults until Neil moves them into a separate tank. The only downside is they aren't the easiest things to dismantle and the juveniles are not the easiest to spot. It's amazing how Neil has been able to so successfully breed such fragile little creatures. Through limited management of, of this system, i.e. The, the food availability and the amount of weed growth and the habitat that was put in the tanks, uh, I found it possible then to rear 96 of those animals through to the following May. So the survival rate over the first year was tremendous. We are in a position now that we've got the knowledge, the know-how, and the ability to be able to breed them in you know, significant numbers to do that when the time is right. The breeding facility at Upper Ribblesdale has seen three generations of white clawed crayfish and is regarded as one of the most successful breeding programmes in the UK. We have bred them on site now for over five years and we've got subsequent generations that are now coming through to breed. But all this work was not just to rear individuals in captivity but to reintroduce crayfish to identified arc sites. In 2000, when crayfish plague was identified, this was a holding site to try and hold crayfish uh, whilst plague burnt out. Because uh, of the, what we knew about plague at the time was that if it didn't have a host, then the plague would burn out, given it didn't have a ready source of other crayfish, so it, it would wipe them out. But once it had gone, it had gone, and then the idea was to be able to put the crayfish back in. We've not been able to put them back out into the wild because we still have an underlying problem and that underlying problem is the, the fact that crayfish plague is still out there. You know, it's it, it, in, in our rivers or in our local river in particular in Upper Ribblesdale, we've still identified that crayfish plague is it's still there from the original outbreak in 2000. So I asked Neil, what is being done to tackle the spread of crayfish plague? We have uh, built some for want of a better word, temporary weirs, which we hope to try and hold back the natural migration of white claw crayfish downstream over some waterfalls, which is where the plague is. The plague's at the bottom, the crayfish at the top are clearer plague, and we've hoped to try and stop those animals drop downstream to allow the plague to burn out naturally. And that will be revisited this spring, which will be, or this summer, should I say, to see if that's been successful. Even with these efforts, the broader picture for white clawed crayfish doesn't look good. Europe-wide crayfish are in decline and 
here around our area we've probably got one of the last strongholds if you like we've got some of the, the best numbers of white claw crayfish in, in Britain and throughout Europe so it's a very important area to try and protect it's quite important that we try and keep them alive and try and do as much as we can for them try and, try and keep them surviving because they've been here since the last ice age so they should, they should be here shouldn't they yes they should and with the dedication of people like Neil and Paul they will be for a long time to come to one of the major attractions of the Yorkshire Dales, Malham Cove. At 100 feet high and nearly 1,000 feet across, it is a spectacular limestone formation that draws visitors to the park from all around the world. I've come to see an animal that has made its home here, the peregrine falcon, and I spoke to Sophie Cade of the RSPB, who runs the peregrine viewpoint. We have nine pairs of peregrine falcons breeding in the Yorkshire Dales National Park, one of which is here at Malham. They are basically varying success rates really on their breeding. The ones at Malham have been really, really successful. They've fledged 35 young in the last 18 years between the different pairs we've had in that time, so that's been fantastic. The, the population in the country is stable at the moment. Some areas will find that, that the population is increasing where there's lots of food abundant and where there's suitable nesting sites. Other areas, there's places where peregrines should be and they aren't there for whatever reason. That could be that nest sites are being disturbed or it could be to do with conflicts and luck with land use. Peregrines have had their fair share of conservation issues and were actually endangered in the 1960s. Certain pesticides, such as DDT, built up in the food chain which prevented their eggs from forming properly. More recently, conflicts with the pigeon racing and game shooting communities resulted in numerous birds being found dead. But thankfully, they have since recovered and the RSPB estimate there are well over a thousand breeding pairs in the UK. The site at Malham is perfect for peregrines and also provides a very accessible site for visitors to see these wonders of the National Park. The views you get here are really second to none in terms of you can have a certain perspective from the ground so you can look up at them and use our telescopes and things to be able to get a good view of them perching but then also you can go to the top of the cove and walk around at the top there and get more amazing views uh, which you just don't get anywhere else you don't get to be on the same level as a peregrine very often when they're literally flying around right above your head you can look down on them flying and that's just absolutely fantastic. The birds play an important role in attracting visitors to the park, but they also have an ecological importance. Birds of prey particularly are really good indicators of the health of an ecosystem. So when you have um, birds of prey such as peregrines or if you've got kites or buzzards, they're a really good indicator of uh, what's going on in that area generally. And with such an idyllic spot, I asked Sophie what role the RSPB and the National Park Authority play in their conservation. In terms of the work the National Park do, that's a full year round job with the wildlife protection officers which will keep an eye on the different peregrine sites um, and generally try and keep a track of what's going on with the population throughout the year and then the RSPB kind of become more involved during the breeding season when we're setting up this viewpoint and bringing the public engagement into it more. Being able to see these amazing birds so conveniently it's easy to forget how important support from the general public is. The public support is so important for projects like this. In a sense, it's one of the, you know, one of the major reasons we run the project is to inform the public, to educate them, to just give them a nice experience, really, so that they can connect with nature. But could such a dependency on support be a problem, especially now in times of a financial downturn? We've actually found that even though financial climate's not looking that great at the moment, people are still really keen to fund conservation. Um, I think that the great thing about, especially a site like this, is watching these birds and feeling that feeling of, wow, this is amazing. It kind of brings people together. Which is great news. With slow signs of recovery from the recession, it's important to consider 
the challenges faced by conservation today. I think public involvement is going to become more and more crucial as the years go on because funding from external sources and from the government is dwindling and so you know if we want to continue doing projects like this, we want to continue looking after at nature around us and these fantastic birds then we all need to kind of pull together and, and do that as one. Finally, I'm visiting Malham Tarn Field Centre to talk to Professor John Altringham of Leeds University about bats in the Yorkshire Dales. Bats are very much neglected, but they're a very important part of our, of our wildlife. That almost one in four of our mammal species are bats, and in terms of numbers, they probably outnumber most other species as well. I asked John what makes them so ecologically important. Bats are very small. All of these bats we're talking about from the size of my thumb you know, up to the size of a hamster. So you know, how can such a small animal be, be that important? But they're, they're, they're insectivores, they feed on insects and they feed on huge numbers of insects. And in some parts of the world, bats have now been shown in the last few years to be important controllers of pests of crops. So in Texas, for instance, they're saving the cotton industry in southern Texas $0.75 million every year just because they eat the moths that uh, lay eggs and caterpillars on the plant. I was intrigued as to how bats were doing locally and how the Yorkshire Dales plays a large part in their conservation. It was recognised 30 years ago that, that bats were in decline and there's lots of anecdotal evidence that we're losing bats, we're losing potentially losing species in this country. So legislation came in to give bats better protection, protecting their roosts primarily and protecting the bats themselves. Here in the Dales we've got a fairly unique system in that we're in a, a limestone landscape and you know underneath this limestone there are lots and lots of caves. So in the Yorkshire Dales more than 1800 cave entrances, hundreds of kilometres of passage and those caves are used by bats. They're used by bats for mating in late summer and in autumn and then they're used for hibernation in the winter. But of course the caves are not just used by bats, we use them, we, we go caving in them and there's, there's a fairly big caving community. And there's absolutely no reason why the two communities can't live together as long as the cavers understand that there are bats there and they cave in an appropriate way. So one of the things we've done in the Yorkshire Dales in addition to studying the bats and understanding which caves are important and why those caves are important is to draw up a conservation code specifically for the Yorkshire Dales caves so that when cavers go caving they know how to disturb the bats as little as possible. And you know, that's obviously very important because in the winter the bats are hibernating, they're trying to save energy, they want to stay asleep most of the winter and noisy cavers are potentially going to wake them up. Um, but follow a simple code and, and the bats are better happy. But it isn't always as simple to understand how effective and successful efforts are. It's the simplest question to ask, how many have we got, are we getting more of them? And it's one of the hardest things to do in biology and it's very difficult to find the resources to do that kind of work. Where we can measure conservation is the impact in terms of education people's attitude to bats, people's knowledge of bats, and there's no doubt that that's gone up enormously in the last 10 or 20 years. Most people now not only know about something about bats, they appreciate bats. They have a, you know, instead of being horrible little uh, creepy creatures, uh, there's something to be admired, something to be curious about. So I think we can certainly measure our success in those terms. And the research Leeds University do goes further into understanding the bat's ecology. We've been trying to understand the sort of intimate relationship between the environment and the bat so that we understand what the bat needs by way of roost and food and how that affects its social behaviour and how that affects its mating behaviour and therefore the whole population structure of the bats is being studied in relation to the landscape. And obviously the better we understand the bats, the better we are able to protect them. The field centre itself has a colony of bats in the eaves of the building, which today Dr Anita Glover and Leeds University students will catch for research purposes. So the roost that's in the uh, north wing at Malantarn is uh, common pipistrels. Um, it's a maternity colony up to about 200 individuals. So there'll be females in there at the moment and they'll have their young because most of them will have given birth. We'll expect them to be emerging um, on average about 20 minutes after sunset. They'll be coming out to feed um, in the immediate area so there's good deciduous woodland and they've got the tarn where there's lots of insects next to the woodland adjacent to the water. So they've really got everything they need here on the reserve which is like an oasis for them. Which is not unlike the Yorkshire Dales in general with all its varied habitats. Bats are very agile and it's a common misconception that they have poor eyesight. So how do you catch bats? When we want to catch bats we've got a range of 
of techniques that we use. So if we're catching them once they're out foraging away from the roost, we can use mist nets, which are similar to the nets that we use to catch birds, or harp traps, um, which is another technique. But if we're catching straight out the roost when they're coming out of small exit points, uh, the simplest thing to do is just to use a hand net, equivalent to a big butterfly net mounted on a long pole. Just have to stand there patiently below the roost and just wait for the bats to emerge and drop into the net. And once the bats are caught, there are numerous ways they can be analysed to manage their conservation. The bats that we catch tonight out of the roost, we are just really interested in recording species, sex, age and reproductive status. Um, but we have other projects where we're interested in recognising individuals, trying to get population estimates and also looking at seasonal movements between where they spend the summer and where they go to mate and hibernate later in the year. So for those projects we're actually ringing the bats that are caught and each ring is an individual number that identifies that particular bat that allows us to look at population structure, at questions to do with paternity analysis and mating systems, so there's a whole sort of suite of questions we can address with those techniques. So with my infrared camera in hand and a bat detector to hear them echolocating, I went to see the first bats emerging. I've met some amazing people working to protect a wonderful place, though I can't help but think I have barely scratched the surface.